Mesopotamia, the cradle of civilization, bore witness to the evolution of warfare from humble beginnings to the might of empires. This region, defined by its rivers and mountains, spawned a legacy of conquests and conflicts that spanned over 3,000 years. Sumer, the land of firsts, marked the beginning of recorded warfare. The Steel of the Vultures, a monument from the early dynastic III period, commemorates the victory of Enatum, the king of Lagash, over Ash, the king of Amma. This iconic steel, named for the vultures depicted hovering over the fallen, encapsulates Sumerian warfare. In Sumer, war was not waged by mere kings but by their patron gods. Enatum and Ash were instruments of the war god Nanata and the patron god Shara, respectively. Humans were seen as servants of gods, and kings acted as divine representatives. War was, therefore, portrayed as the will of the gods to maintain cosmic order. The conflict between Lagash and Amma revolved around irrigated land between the two cities, marked by a boundary stone. Ush's transgression of moving the stone disrupted the established order created by the gods. Enaton claimed victory for justice, restoring order, and securing Ush's promise not to threaten the region's stability again. However, the true motives behind these wars were often control over valuable resources and trade routes. In this era, city-states had their militias, summoned as needed. These soldiers wielded bronze or iron spears, javelins, axes, daggers, slings, and basic bows. Chariots, pulled by donkeys, served as mobile armories. As warfare progressed, leather armor and helmets were replaced by copper and bronze. Sumerians achieved another first with the golden wig, dated around 2500 BCE, marking the inception of helmets. These helmets showcased their innovation and evolving approach to warfare. Mesopotamian warfare was more than just conflict, it was a reflection of a complex society built on divine will and earthly ambitions. As the region progressed through time, its military capabilities would become even more formidable, shaping the course of history in the process. The city-states of Mesopotamia, each with its militia, evolved from small-scale conflicts to monumental battles, thanks to technological advancements and strategic thinking. Picture a Sumerian military unit, a central phalanx of hundreds, maybe thousands, of spearmen, tightly packed and ready for battle. Skilled non-commissioned officers barked orders to maintain formation, and drummers kept the troops in step. Behind them, a swarm of slingers, the equivalent of today's riflemen, showered the enemy with deadly projectiles while battle chariots, drawn by asses, carried reserves of missiles. This formidable force was the core of Enatum's army, the king of Lagash. He led this military might against rival city-states, laying the groundwork for what Sargon of Akkad would soon achieve. In 2334 BCE, Sargon created the Akkadian Empire, the world's first multinational empire. His conquests began with loyal troops, later bolstered by conscripts from vanquished cities. To strengthen his rule, he established a professionally trained standing army. This force expanded his empire from modern-day Syria to Lebanon and Iran. Sargon didn't just replace militias with professional soldiers, he improved their formation and weaponry. He trained his troops in a dense six-man deep phalanx, with rectangular shields protecting the front line. Behind this formation, slingers and archers unleashed a rain of projectiles, now aided by a groundbreaking innovation, the composite bow. Made from layered wood, bone, and sinew, this bow revolutionized warfare, providing greater range and accuracy. The introduction of new weaponry prompted advancements in armor, setting off an arms race. For example, the invention of metal helmets led to the creation of battle axes designed to pierce them. Sargon also repositioned heavy chariots to the rear as transport vehicles, no longer needed as mobile armories. Archers began crafting their projectiles from clay found outside Mesopotamian cities. Sargon's army didn't just rely on strength but also intellect. Scribes accompanied the troops, calculating the force required to breach city walls or build offensive ramps. They kept records of prisoners and their fates, whether they were sold as slaves, retained by generals, or executed. With this formidable army, Sargon conquered Mesopotamia. He secured trade routes and centers of production, much like Enatum before him, but on a grander scale. Yet, this era was not to last. The Akkadian Empire declined, yielding to the Kshins. However, they, too, were overthrown by the Ur-3 kings, 
Er Namu and his son, Shulgi, championed a more benevolent monarchy, promoting nonviolent resolutions to conflicts. By the 20th century BCE, the Amorites took center stage. King Hammurabi, inspired by Sargon's model, established a professional army, allied with Lhasa to defeat the Elamites, and subsequently seized control of Mesopotamia from Babylon. His tactical genius extended to damming water supplies before battles or using floods to weaken his foes. The tale of Mesopotamian warfare is one of innovation, strategy, and ever-evolving weaponry. From the phalanxes of Enatum to the composite bows of Sargon and the calculated brilliance of Hammurabi, each era left its mark on the sands of Mesopotamia. Hammurabi's empire had a brief life, and the Kassites soon took control. In the meantime, the Hittites had already been making strides, wielding a professionally trained army inspired by Babylon's model. King the I went on to conquer the kingdom of Mitanni, which had previously held the Assyrians as vassals. With Mitanni weakened, the Assyrians, led by Adadna Rei, seized their chance and established the mighty Assyrian Empire. Tukulti Nanata I was a significant player, defeating the Hittites at the Battle of Nairia and sacking Babylon in a daring move. Although this sacrilege led to his assassination, the plundered wealth from Babylon bolstered the Assyrian military and set the stage for Tiglath Pileser I. This ruler reinvigorated the economy and bolstered the military's power. The Assyrians were particularly renowned for their siege warfare. They possessed a specialized corps of engineers and a variety of methods to breach enemy walls, from sappers undermining fortifications to mobile ladders that helped cross moats. Their crowning achievement was the towering wooden siege engines, equipped with battering rams and archers, which could roll right up to city walls. The Assyrians, like their predecessors, justified their military conquests as the will of the gods. They elevated their god Asher to near monotheistic status, claiming him as the supreme leader of their armies. Just as Enatum invoked Nanata, Sargon called upon Inanna slash Ishtar, and Hammurabi claimed Marduk's guidance, the Assyrians placed their faith in Asher. Even when Sargon II defeated Oatu in a seemingly impossible battle, he attributed the victory not to his own prowess, but to the divine will of Asher. The Neo-Assyrian Empire eventually crumbled in 612 BCE, succumbing to a coalition of Babylonians, Medes, and Persians. The Persians, under Cyrus the Great, established the Achaemenid Empire, surpassing even the Assyrians in territorial conquest with their own professionally trained army. The empires marched on, Alexander the Great toppled the Achaemenids, replaced by the Seleucid Empire, succeeded by the Parthians, and then the Sasanians. All along, the military paradigm Sargon established endured. While there were notable reforms, such as the swifter two-wheeled chariot, these armies still hearkened back to Sargon's legacy. Ultimately, the Sasanian Empire fell to the invading Muslim Arabs, who, too, invoked divine will to justify their conquests. The claim that a god sanctioned one's military campaign has persisted through millennia, shaping the course of history, and echoing down to the present day. It's a reminder that even as empires rise and fall, some patterns endure, eternally justifying the drums of war.